Hey guys, you're watching Python Tutorials on my YouTube channel, Python for Microscopists. In this tutorial, I'm gonna talk about feature-based image segmentation using traditional machine learning. And when I say traditional machine learning, this is where uh, you extract a whole bunch of features by feature engineering. You pick the features that you want and then use either random forest or support vector machines, one of the traditional machine learning uh, approaches. And this is, I believe, much better than deep learning approaches because oftentimes for most applications, you do not have the type of data that's required for deep learning. So traditional machine learning works very well, sometimes, uh, in fact, all the time, much better than deep learning if you do not have a lot of training data. Okay, I've already done quite a few videos on this topic. If you go ahead and watch videos 57 through 67. In fact, if you watch uh, uh, the, the video about Gabor filters and then feature-based uh, or traditional machine learning, consider this as an extension of that, okay? Because quite a few have asked me if uh, I, uh, how to use multiple images uh, for training because uh, in my example, I showed only a single image. So this is why I'm recording this video. Okay, now let me jump in uh, to show one quick thing. Again, in the last video here, again, uh, 57, 58, 59, 60, watch those videos about traditional machine learning. For training, I used only a single image, right? One single image. And uh, uh, I generated uh, Gabor features, a whole bunch of Gabor features. Again, watch my video on Gabor. Uh, to learn more about this. And then we also generated a, a whole bunch of other features. When I say generated features, we applied filters onto the original image to extract the responses. And that's what we are calling features, okay? So Canny Edge, Robert, Sobel, and a whole bunch of other features. And finally, we used Random Forest. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through a few of these steps, but in the context of using multiple images, but not just a single image, okay? Now, if you are very much familiar with Python uh, programming, then you know what I'm talking about. You can either use uh, functions where you put everything into a function and then call the function and apply it onto multiple images as you read them, or you can just put a for loop and there are many ways to do in this, okay? I'm gonna show you how to do it using a for loop. Now, uh, one quick note again before jumping in, Gabor filter is my favorite when it comes to traditional machine learning because it's one convolutional filter where you can generate thousands of uh, filters from one, thousands of digital filters. Now, by changing the kernel size, by changing sigma, theta, lambda, gamma, uh, you can actually create a whole bunch of filters. So in this example, I'm uh, defining these parameters and let's actually go ahead and run this so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Here is the input uh, image right here. This is my input image with all these lines. And I did that for a reason. And on the left-hand side is the kernel. Uh, that got generated using these features, right? With a kernel size of five, sigma three, theta equals to pi over four, and lambda is pi over four, gamma 0.4, and so on. With that specific uh, values, this is the filter. And when this gets applied onto the image, this is the response right here on the right hand side. This is the filtered image. As you can see, the digital filter is aligned along the 45 degrees or diagonal. That means it's uh, it's like a bandpass filter. It's passing all the signal responses that are aligned in that direction and blocking everything that's not. So you can clearly see all these horizontal uh, or diagonal lines over there. Okay, so uh, you can imagine how powerful this is. And this is a great way of actually detecting texture especially if the texture is aligned in a specific direction, or even if it is in a random direction, this is a great one. But one filter is not enough. You have to create a bank of filters, meaning you have to change the sigma multiple times, theta, lambda, gamma, all of these, and then generate a whole bunch. Okay, with that information, let's actually jump into the actual code for today's video. Now, uh, what am I using for training images? So I put all the training images in a folder called training images. And again, you do not need a lot of data for traditional machine learning. In this case, I only have like uh, 10 images there, okay? And these are all uh, images. Again, it doesn't matter what image you have, but in this case, I'm using a X-ray microscope image, which is a micro CT, but it doesn't do the justice if I say micro CT. This is an X-ray microscope, uh, which is a 3D volume, and uh, it's from a sandstone showing different regions. So the goal is to segment it. First, you need labels, and uh, I've used a different machine learning algorithm to kind of create my labels here, which is in a way cheating. But how did I get these labels to begin with? 
uh, I started with a few labels and then generated this. This is a great way of generating data for your deep learning, yeah? So the, uh, the way I started off is actually with a few of these labels. So if I open this image, you see right there, so this is my labeled image and you see most of this uh, image, they have a pixel value of zero, the most of this image. Now, some of these pixels have value of four. This one has a value of three and somewhere in between there is a value of two and one that you don't see. And in fact, if I bring a different image, you probably see. So I started off by just painting a few pixels and then saving the masks like this and running a machine learning algorithm like the one I sh I'm, I'm about to show you, and then generated uh, a whole bunch of segmented images. Now I can, uh, after verifying that they're good, I can use these as my masks for other tasks. Okay, how did I paint these few pixels? Well, um, I used, uh, let me just show you a quick way. Um, please go to www.appear.com, A-P-E-E-R.com. Again, this is an initiative. Uh, this is what I do at work. So this is an initiative by Zeiss. And uh, in the next few weeks, uh, by sometime around July 2020 timeframe, I'm not sure when you're watching this. If you're watching this after July 2020, the tool is probably already here. If not, just wait a couple of weeks for that annotation tool to be made available as part of a peer. It's a great tool where you just paint the pixels, save the masks, okay? Okay, that's enough background information. Let's just jump into the code now. So here, are, there are seven steps I'm gonna show you. Step number one, read training images and extract the features, right? We are going to read multiple images, extract features, create a data frame. Then read labeled images and create another data frame. When I say data frame, this is the pandas data frame. Obviously, I hope uh, you watched my pandas tutorials. And uh, get the data ready for random forest. We have to do some pre-processing uh, to the data, massaging of the data to get it ready. And then let's define the classifier and fit the model, meaning let's define the random forest or support vector machines if you want to use it. And, uh, and uh, fit, fit the model. That's uh, obviously a slow process. Once it's done, check the accuracy of the model. Of course, you need to know how good it is doing. Save the model for future use. And of course, now that you have a model, you can go ahead and predict your images. Okay, let me just quickly walk you through. Again, I'll share this uh, on my GitHub page. Again, go ahead and search for Python for microscopies on GitHub or just look for the link in the description down below, okay? Uh, all the relevant libraries, in fact, I don't need Glob. I'm not using that uh, for now. So let's uh, look at step one, read the training images. What I'm doing, initially I create a blank data frame to capture all the information I'm going to generate from my image data set. Okay, and then I define my image path as images slash train images. This is where uh, this is where uh, train images. This is where my training images are located. These are the raw images. Okay, and uh, compared to the last time, I added a few lines. Again, I'll show you uh, why. And I created a temporary data frame. So as we read each image, all the information is captured into that data frame, and then I add that that information to this other data frame. Again, there are many ways to do that, doing this. This is one way I thought of doing. So uh, there you go. Again, you'll see what's happening in a minute. Okay, now we are all ready to read our input images. I'm using OpenCV to read the input images and the location is nothing but our image path and for image in this path, right? So when I do this, all it's doing is for each image in this directory, uh, first, go ahead and print the image to make sure sanity check. Are you reading the right images and all that stuff, okay? So, uh, and uh, the way you read it is again, so image is the file name here, right? When you do os.list directory, it gives you the list of files in that specific directory. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, this is basically the path to the input image. So input, for example, for the first image, okay? We read the image. Next, it's going to check this. And this is what I added. So you can work with, so you don't have to worry with whether the images are grayscale, you know, RGB or what's going on. So what this does is basically checks if the dimensions of the images is three, meaning do you have X, Y and number of channels? Uh, you, it would be three if it is a RGB image, right? And if the input shape equals to three, right? Which means it's an RGB image, then convert your images into uh, uh, gray. 
If not, if the number of dimensions equals to two, then your image equals to your input image, right? I mean, that's you don't have to do any processing there. Otherwise, if it's some weird shape, just throw an exception saying, hey, it only works with uh, grayscale and RGB. This is pretty standard. Okay, now that we have that, let's start adding data to the data frame. Which data frame? The temporary data frame that we just created, okay? So to this data frame, I'm going to add some data. Which what do what do I want to add? First of all, the pixel value itself is a great feature. So let's add pixel values, and everything we are capturing it as individual columns. For each feature, all the values are in individual columns. So this creates a column called pixel value and adds all the pixel values. By the way, I reshaped the image to a single column, right? So when you do minus one, that's what it does. Otherwise, your image is your height and width, the two-dimensional uh, uh, you know, data set or NumPy array. Okay, so, uh, and I, I'm also creating a new column called image name and adding the name of the image. Remember, this image is nothing but as we iterate through each image. So that's the value. So it adds the image name. Why am I doing that? Just for a sanity check. If you have 10 images, you keep adding. I usually go to, when I'm developing code, I usually go to the first image and look at the pixel values and actually look at the image and the pixel values. Okay, this is doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, but this is always a good idea to add the name. Uh, and also later on when you actually uh, get your masks, later on when you get your masks from your mask folder, it, sometimes actually it's a good idea to label your mask and image exactly the same thing. So if image is train images 00.tiff, I should have labeled this train image 006. I didn't do this here, I'm breaking my own rule, but if you label them the same, then you can compare the file names and then say, okay, I'm getting the corresponding features. Again, this is all for sanity check. It's not required, but it's good, good habit. Obviously I broke that. Okay, now uh, we added two features already. Well, image name is not a feature, but two columns already. Image pixel value is the feature. Next, Gabor features. I just talked about Gabor, but in this case, I'm changing theta, I'm changing sigma, I'm changing lambda, and I'm changing gamma. For each of this, we are going to generate uh, a Gabor kernel, meaning the filter that I showed you earlier, the digital filter, and then apply that digital filter. We are going to get the Gabor kernel and apply that kernel onto our image, okay? So this is where we are applying that onto our original image. Again, please watch my Gabor uh, video uh, to get more information on this part. So uh, now it gets that, and now you have your filtered image, which is our, obviously after the filter is applied, and I'm reshaping it to minus one again, converting it to a column and adding it to our data frame, okay? And uh, and it adds, I think in this case, 38 or so, because it's going through these two, and uh, you can do the math here. It adds about 38 different uh, columns uh, uh, corresponding to 38 different Gabor filters. And this part is easy. So uh, now keep adding another column to our data frame called Canny Edge and apply Canny Edge from OpenCV. Robert's filter, uh, I think is part of Scikit image. So keep adding, and it's up to you now. You can throw in uh, the more filters, the better it is, typically for machine learning. So once everything is done, now remember this image data set that I have up here? this image data set, the blank one that we created. So at the end of the image, at the end of all the features for image, I'm going to append the data frame that we have been accumulating for each image. That's it. This is how you do it for multiple images, okay? So you can exit this video right now if you don't, don't care about the rest of this uh, uh, you know, part. But uh, so I did exactly the same thing even for masks, okay? So I created a dummy or empty data frame for mask to hold da mask data set, but for mask, we are not doing a bunch of filters, right? What do we need for mask? The file name and the values, pixel values. That's exactly what we are doing. So we are uh, walking through the file names, os.lister, mask path within this, this path. And for each image, we are going to read it and then same, three lines here, uh, if, elf, and else, uh, convert it to gray if it's not already gray, but most importantly, reshape your labels and add the label value, right? This is basically what we have done for our images. Okay, so once you do that, then I'm also going to capture the mask name 
And uh, finally, what do we do? Add all of that to our mask data set, which is this data set. And as the images, as the next mask gets uploaded, then this data frame gets reset to blank and then the new information gets captured and we are going to append that. This is how you put things in loop. This is one way you put things in loop. Probably using functions would be a better way, but again, uh, um, for loops is not bad. Okay, so uh, the next step, now that we have our mask and images ready, we have to put all the information into one data set, right? So that's exactly what I'm doing. So uh, get the data ready. So I'm creating uh, uh, a new data frame called data set where I'm concatenating, which means you can concatenate rows, meaning add the rows or add columns. So my axis equals to one, that means concatenate along the column path, okay? So it's going to uh, put this image data set and mask data set together and create a master data set, okay? Uh, Memory-wise, this is probably not a very efficient way of doing things, but it, it, it's, it should be fine, okay, on most systems. Now that my data set is ready, I think I'm almost ready. One thing that I added here is, uh, uh, drop all the labels with a value of zero. Now remember the example I just showed you. If, I mean, in this case, uh, this is important, so I hope you're still watching the video. <laughs> anyway, so in this case, every corner of my image, every pixel here has some value that's not zero. Okay, but when you label it manually, that's not how you do it. When you label it manually, there is no way you can, uh, well, you can if you take all day to paint every pixel, but oftentimes your labels look probably like this. Maybe a bit more, but oftentimes they look like this. So if you have a bunch of zeros right here for unlabeled pixels, then when you do the machine learning algorithm, it thinks that zero is uh, one of the features, one of the regions that you're trying to segment, and all your images would look black when you segment it. I hope this, this makes sense, yeah? In summary, maybe if you only have few labels, you do not want to include a label of zero because that's just unlabeled. It doesn't belong to any class. So that's exactly the reason why I added that specific line over there saying that, okay, my data set is a subset of my data set where the label values are not equal to zero, okay? So that's uh, that line. And then now we are ready to define our X and Y. Remember, any machine learning algorithm, you have X and Y. X is all the features that you're training on and Y is the prediction. Y is what you're trying to predict, okay? So our X here is all the features, like I just mentioned, which means my entire data frame that we have created here, the entire data set, except for the ones that are not features. What are not features? The image name, mask name are not features. Obviously these are names. And label values are also not features. This is the prediction that we're trying to make, okay? So drop these three along axis one, which means drop these columns and you have your X. Your Y is very simple. Your Y is your data set with only the label values column. You know, you just want the labels. This is what we are trying to predict. Yeah, is, is that pixel belonging to zero, one, two, three, four, which one does it belong to, okay? So that's what Y is. And this part is, again, I've done this in the last, uh, most of my tutorials where we use uh, scikit-learn's uh, train test split to actually split our data set of X and Y into training data set and testing data set. So that way you can train on 80% of the data and then test on 20%. So you get like a good estimate of how it is doing. Okay, so that's what it is. So in this case, I'm uh, uh, holding 20% for testing and the remaining 80% for, uh, for, for training purposes. Okay, uh, now we are all set to define our classifier. Again, uh, from scikit-learn, I'm importing random forest classifier. Unfortunately, random forest in scikit-learn do not, does not use GPU. If you are working on a system with GPU, like if you are used to TensorFlow, that doesn't work. I found a couple of libraries on uh, that contain random forest, like I think Dask actually has uh, a new random forest, but it only works on a Linux system, so it's not on uh, uh, Windows. If anyone, if any of you viewers, if you know of, uh, you know, a GPU way of using random forest, please, please include that as part of the comments so others can benefit from it. Okay, for now, I'm gonna use CPU. And we define our model. Our model is random forest classifier. 
and the parameters it takes is you can leave it empty but i'm going to define number of estimators okay this is the number of trees uh, and the more well i almost said the more the better but if you have a lot of uh, these estimators then your results can go the other way so uh, experiment with this i typically work between 50 and 100 okay the number of estimators and random state is basically every time i run this i want repeatable results so i'm uh, fixing fixing this state uh, of randomization okay now if this is a deep learning obviously your model is uh, layer you know uh, convolutional layers and dropouts and uh, you know uh, uh, for example uh, you can have dense layers and uh, and you create your you put together your model that way but in this case this is just random forest if it is support vectors go ahead and import support vectors so you define your model once you have it then it's as simple as model.fit, just like you do it in deep learning or any other machine learning. You fit uh, the model using your training data. What is your training in X? What is your training in Y, right? I mean, X is your features and Y is your, your prediction, that's it. When you run that, of course, uh, now you have created a model and it stores all the information within a variable called model. Now we can apply the model to do certain tasks. What do we want to do? Uh, predict on our X test. Remember, some of the data set we are holding off 20% of it for testing. So that's what that part is, okay? X test and model.predict on the test and then go ahead and print out the values. In this case, I'm, I was getting 98 point uh, something. I'm not gonna run the code as you see. I'm not executing the code because I, I've done that uh, already and it took a couple of hours for me uh, to do this. So I'm not gonna do any of this. Uh, and once you have this model, finally, if you're happy with the accuracy, go ahead and uh, uh, use pickle to dump it into a file name. And we call this sandstone model here. So it dumped it. And uh, if I go back to my feature right there, in fact, I renamed it as sandstone model new and it's 876 megabytes. It has all the information about this random forest. Now, step number seven, go ahead and predict it. And how do you predict? You import an image. And that image must have all the features that you used as part of your training, right? So as part of our training, we generated these Gabors and all of these. So when you read an image, you generate the same Gabors and the same features. So you, it's, it's very important. Your input images must uh, go through the same uh, you know, features and then you can just apply it. So to make things easy, now I'm showing you a, a function-based approach. Previously, we did for loops. Now I defined all my features as part of a function called feature extraction. And I put like my Gabor and everything. So what is returned by this function is a data frame, a pandas data frame, okay? So now down here, I'm actually uh, uh, using the pickle, remember in the previous step, we actually dumped our model into a pickle, uh, you know, used pickle to dump the model into a file name. So now I'm using pickle to unwrap that model or load the model. Okay. Once the model is loaded, now I'm using my os.list directory again to go through each image that I want to segment. Again, now we are predicting, right? So I want a segment. So these are all test images, not train images. And uh, I'm reading the images just like I did the last time. I'm converting them to uh, gray just like the last time. And then applying feature extraction. Remember this function, this function that we just defined, applying that right there, meaning what gets returned is a data frame of all the, of all the features. Now we just apply our model.predict. Okay, previously we called it model, now I'm calling it loaded model. You can call it anything, okay? So apply that onto your X and then reshape the result into original image shape because you wanna convert that into an image and reshape it into your original image shape and save the image and save it to your folder. So here is, uh, again, here is my uh, test images that I have and the segmented results are dumped into the segmented and here are the segmented results, okay? I think it makes sense to compare them with the test images. I'll let you do it on your own samples, but uh, let's do this uh, and let's put this right here. Not bad, right? Very good. So including, so my goal was to detect these clay regions. You see this, this textured regions right there, textured regions right here. So the yellow regions on the right, 
that was my goal and it did an amazing job in detecting the regions that are rich in clay. These are, this is very difficult to segment uh, if you use traditional machine learning approaches. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you use traditional image processing approaches. So uh, I hope you found this tutorial to be useful. Again, as usual, I request you to subscribe to this channel and uh, watch the rest of the videos, whether you're looking for deep learning or machine learning or traditional uh, image processing. I'm trying to record as many videos as possible. This is not just for microscopy. This is, as you probably realize, any image processing in general. Thank you very much. And thank you for being patient because I know you watched 24 minutes of this video. So thank you.